Raw, Conversations with Creative People. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce you to Chip Thomas, also known as Jetson Arama. Chip is a public artist, an activist, a photographer, a physician, and a storyteller. If this is your first time watching Art in the Raw, you might be wondering who I am. In a nutshell, I'm someone that's been in love with art and music my entire life. I've now been working in the professional gallery world for 15 years, and I started Art in the Raw about halfway through 2020 to keep people connected and inspired. If you see value in that, consider subscribing and telling like-minded friends. If you'd like to know a little bit more about the show or tonight's guest, take a look at the description below. But in the meantime, I'm excited to introduce you to Chip. Welcome, Chip. Yeah, thank you, Anne. It's a pleasure. I've seen you described as a public artist, an activist. You're a photographer. You're also a physician. Let's give people more, more context. You've been living on the Navajo Nation. Yes, I've been living here now for 34, actually over 34 years. I came out here in 1987. When I say out here, the area where I am is near the community of Shanto. So we're, we're about 55 miles east of Page, Arizona, northern Arizona, about 30 miles from the border with Utah. But yeah, super beautiful area, canyons. Not as many people now living a traditional lifestyle as there were when I first came 34 years ago, but it's just been an amazing opportunity to be in this community for this long, being an intergenerational family practice physician who also does public art and who uses art to advocate for the well being of the community. When we originally met, or I originally learned of you, it was through your, your wheat paste <laughs> art. Yeah. And that was actually many years ago, and that was its own story. And, and I could be wrong, but it seems like maybe in the time period that you've been working in wheat paste, did you go from more elusive? That is correct. So when I started wheat pasting in 2009, I was making wheat paste, a paste from flour, wheat, wheat flour, bluebird, in fact. So this was 2009, and that was around the time, I think maybe 2010, Banksy's exit through the gift shop came out. There were several street art blogs that were popular at the time, Vandalog, Wooster Collective. The thing that was pretty consistent for many street artists at the time was to keep their identity obscured. I tried that for about 18 months or so. As my pieces got bigger, it really helped to work during the day to figure out how to align the pieces properly. So when I was working with smaller pieces, I could sneak around at night getting pieces up. As they've gotten bigger, I've engaged the community and the wall owners more, which is really nice because it's deepened the nature of my relationship with the community, talking to people about why I feel this art project is, is important. One of the rare situations that you're in is you've had permission putting up the pieces on abandoned buildings. The um, buildings aren't always abandoned. A lot of the roadside stands where I get work up, you know, people are still going to those stands on a regular basis selling art. But, but your point is well taken in that the imagery that I choose to use, I like to say, reflects the beauty of the community that they've shared with me over the time that I've been here. And there's certainly a sense of continuity, knowing families and their histories pretty, pretty closely. It's an interesting thing because now that people know I'm the person doing the art, I feel that the art project has really deepened my connection to the community. People will get the sense, for example, that the art that I'm putting up is coming from a place of love. So I would hope they would take a, take a moment to step back and wonder, well, <laughs> You know, if his art practice has this component, what is he like as a physician? And mm -hmm. I would like to think, you know, that same sense of caring and concern is present there as well. And people pick up on that. But yeah, it's definitely been a unique mm -hmm. journey, a fulfilling journey. It's been a while since I've gotten a piece up that hasn't been sanctioned. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with wall owners about why 
I'd like to use the wall for, for the purpose of putting art up and why I feel that's important for the community. Fortunately, wall owners by and large around this region have been receptive. It really transforms the, the community that you're living in. And I'd, I'd read that people really kind of appreciated that you could be driving through the land and see these beautiful murals of the people that actually live there. And it made it almost a friendlier community. Yeah, back in 2011, I was dating a woman who made an interesting observation. The tolerance of the community for something totally new and different is really a reflection on the community, which I think is a nice way of looking at this because there's really not a tradition of muralism per se on the Navajo Nation. There's not a history of a lot of public art on the, on the Navajo Nation and the history of pho photography and native communities is fraught with, um, I, I mean, it's a problematic endeavor. And in truth, I first came here in 1987. One of the first things that I did was I built a home dark room and I'd go out into the community, spend time with folks and to the extent they were comfortable. I, I like to shoot in a documentary style, um, usually in black and white. I got some captivating images over the years and has some opportunity to show work in various galleries around the country. It's been an interesting thing because I really feel that my art practice took a step forward and things became more reciprocal in a sense when I started putting the work outside rather than in white cubes of um, gallery walls because mm -hmm. I really have to be responsible to the community in a different way. When work is up in a gallery, very few people who are actually pictured in my images would see the shows, you know, would, would see the uh, body of work. They would get copies of the photograph that included them, but they didn't get a comprehensive sense of what I was doing or the story that I was telling. But um, putting the work in a public space makes me be responsible in a way I didn't necessarily have to be before. Well, and I do think that's an interesting situation and particularly involving photography and street art on a larger scale the gallery museum scene versus the street art scene. A lot of people aren't comfortable in museums or galleries. So when you start displaying your work in more of a mural or, or street art sense, it's just kind of for everybody. And there's something I think that's just really kind of beautiful about that. Yeah, right on. And one of the beautiful things about that as well was, you know, during the pandemic, when we were in lockdown especially, and mm -hmm. people didn't have an opportunity to go indoors to experience art. I appreciated having the opportunity to get work up outside that could be experienced by anyone driving by and hopefully instill something positive, something uplifting in them during a time that was, um, that has been really hard, especially here on the Navajo Nation. When we first started talking, I was saying there was a connection between profession as a physician and your interest in being a public artist. And it seems like overall, just you as a person, you're interested in uplifting people. To try to tie it all together and hopefully not sounding too cliche, I say this a lot and I, it's, I feel it's true. Mm -hmm. In my work, in my day-to-day -day work as a physician, when I'm encount encountering individuals and or families, I'm listening to stories, I'm getting histories from people and using that information to try to improve the quality of their lives such that I'm attempting to create an environment of wellness within the individual. That's a very deliberate act on my part, as I said, to reflect back to the community the beauty that they've shared with me. And in so doing, I'm attempting to create an environment of wellness within the community. So yeah, I, I do see the uh, two practices as being complementary. As I understand it, you've started a project called the Painted Desert Project, where you've been inviting other artists from around the world. Is that right? To around the world and around the uh, reservation. The thing that happened really is in 2009, I had just gone through a very difficult period, the death of my dad, the loss of the family home, which we'd been in for 50 years, and I got a divorce. This all happened between 2006 
2007. Every five years, every five to six years since I've been working here on the Navajo Nation, I try to get away for a little bit just to um, go to a different part of the world. You know, I think in order to think outside the box, it helps to get out of the box. So in 2009, I went to Brazil for three months. And for the last part of that trip, for the last three weeks, I fell in with a community of street artists. And that was amazing because since I became aware of street art and people painting on trains and Keith Haring, and I'd go to New York City, you know, looking for painted trains, looking for painted walls. So when I was in Brazil in 2009, it was really like a mini residency where I had an opportunity to learn. There were street artists in Brazil from all over the world, from uh, Italy, from France, Germany, from Brazil, from the States. Here I was, a bit of a standout. I was 52 at the time. These were all younger, younger people. But I think they appreciated my enthusiasm for this art form. And it's an interesting thing as well, because a lot of times when I take these trips away from work, sabbaticals, I'm hoping that I will get an epiphany. You know, I'm hoping I'll, fig I'll get some sense of why I'm here on this earth, what my uh, purpose is. But in 2009, I, having come through this difficult time in my life, I just really wanted to chill. And it was awesome because Brazil gave me this amazing gift of this art form that I really love. So just before I left Brazil, an artist who was a part of this group of folks in Salvador, Bahia and Brazil, you know, grabbed my arms and told me to keep this energy going. I had been giving marching orders. I was on a mission, you know. The folks in Brazil showed me photos of the installation JR did in Rio of the women's eyes pasted on the outside of a favela, looking down onto the wealthy beaches. Uh, that was the real game changer for me, seeing how a photograph could be blown up and applied to a large wall as a form of street art. So when I came back to the States in March of 2009, I Googled a recipe for making wheat paste and went to uh, Kinko's at the time and asked them to blow up a photograph. And I started doing my project in 2011, 2012. There was a project called the Boneyard Project at the Air and Space Museum or the Air Museum outside of Tucson. There was a fundraiser. They invited street artists from all over the world to come and paint these old World War II bomber airplanes. So there was that street art project. There was one in New York City called the Underbelly Project where Jordan Sealer and one other artist invited artists from all over the world again over the course of a year to paint work in an abandoned subway station in the city. Mm -hmm. So I was inspired by you know, those art projects. There was living walls in Atlanta. There was open walls in Baltimore where street artists were, were coming together to make work. So I thought it would be cool to invite artists, you know, to come spend time with me here on the Navajo Nation, meet some people and um, have a cultural exchange with artists, the medium. And it's awesome because it's, you know, over the years, it's actually grown into a bit of a community service project where we've repaired people's roadside stands. We have built a food stand for one of my neighbors here who um, sells at a flea market every Saturday. Yeah, it's been a nice coming together of people from all over the world and all over the state of Arizona. I gotta say, that's just kind of amazing and inspiring. I had a guest on a past episode, Fernando, who is a street artist curator in Porto, Portugal. So well, if you were to go there, he would prepare a wall for you if it was possible. That's a pretty if, sweet deal. I do a similar thing here. I, I would like to think I do. <laughs> you know, working with wall owners, especially artists who come from out of the country or even artists who come from different parts of the States, giving them a sense of how the cosmology, the worldview on the Navajo Nation differs from where these artists are coming from. So mm -hmm. I recommend reading materials and films they should check out. And then it's important for them to interact with people once they uh, get here. But I mean, I, I do think of myself as a street art curator as well. A nice thing about inviting artists from all over the world is when I travel to different places, I now have connections who can hopefully 
help me obtain walls. <laughs> One of the other differences that I really appreciate too between street art and the gallery scene, and you know, I don't come from an art background, so I really can't speak authoritatively about the uh, gallery scene, mm -hmm. but there just seems to be more of a sense of cooperation and collaboration within the uh, street art community. I would, I would love more people to feel more comfortable coming into museums, but there's definitely this value in just you're walking down the street and you see this thing and it just hits you. And even if you don't think you're into art, you see it and you feel it and you have this experience with it. Yeah. I just think that's beautiful. Well, and there's a lot to be said for experience of finding something that you weren't anticipating. You know, a lot of times when people go to galleries, they're going specifically for the purpose of seeing art. It's another thing to be in your head, in your space, walking down a street or driving down a highway and to, you know, see something that momentarily transforms you or helps you transcend mm -hmm. what you might be experiencing in that moment. So the unexpected element of surprise, is a component of, of street art. I love that and that you've brought that to the place that you have lived for 30 years. And I also love the story of how you you ended up moving there originally, which I understand it was or out of school, you were invited to move there. Were they going to reduce your student loans because it was an area that people weren't necessarily moving to. Yeah, yeah, you you got the uh, gist of it. Out of the uh, Great Society of Kennedy and Johnson from the 60s, there came VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America for Teachers. There was the Peace Corps. So there was an emphasis on programs that attempted to engage people from different communities, different cultures at kind of a grassroots level. So for healthcare, for medicine and dentistry, the U.S. government came up with a program, National Health Service Corps, where the government would pay for the student's education for a minimum of two years, maximum of four years. The number of years that you receive support or scholarship, then you owe that amount of time working in a health sh shortage area. I had a four-year obligation, thought I would be here for two years. And yeah, here we are 34 years later. Eugene Richards, he's a, a member of a Magnum photo agency. He was shooting for Life magazine in the late 80s, early 90s. And he did some amazing work. One of the photo essays that he did was Cocaine True, Cocaine Blue, where he looked at the impact mm -hmm. of the cocaine epidemic, spe specifically crack. I think in two communities in New York and one in Philadelphia or vice versa. He taught for a week out of the summer in 92. And I had an opportunity to spend a week with him, which for me was a dream come true because he's a masterful storyteller visually. And he breaks a lot of rules. Just a really compassionate person. And he took the time to look through my portfolio at the time. He gave me some useful feedback, but one of his observations was, you know, if I chose to stay in this community, he really felt that I would be able to tell some amazing stories. Neither one of us anticipated that I would go big in telling those stories. I mean, I think he was absolutely right because, you know, the basis of the relationship and storytelling is really built around trust. And I, I've, I've been here long enough to have gained some element of trust. True. And all of the photo projects I've seen over the years that have that element, you can see that relationship between the photographer and the subject. Most of the people you're photographing, you, you know them, you know their entire families, you know the, the history. You're not just someone showing up with a camera. So yeah, you said you thought you were going to leave after what, two, four years was the commitment and you yeah. just love it, right? Yeah, that's a fair statement. I won't lie. This past year has been most challenging, you know, during the pandemic, the Navajo Nation took a, took a pretty hard hit. But uh, no, by and large, I mean, I, I definitely love this work and love this community. You're also an activist, so some of the imagery you've depicted post-pandemic has had to do with land disputes and uranium and mining and radiation. It's not all positive things that are happening, but it's calling attention to what is happening. So with regard to the 
uranium mining. So the Navajo Nation is a fascinating place in that there's five natural resources here that are, four of them have been exploited for energy, and the fifth is water that's found in, in aquifers, which may seem like a nice moron in that we're in the a high elevation desert, but there's there's actually an abundance of water in, in aquifers here, but there's also coal, oil, natural gas, and uranium, which was discovered in the 1940s, I'm pretty sure, but it really wasn't exploited fully until we mined uranium largely from native land here in the Southwest and in the, the Northern Plains states to build up yeah, the nuclear arsenal during the Cold War. So what most people in the country don't realize is that the majority of the uranium for the Cold War came from this region. And the regulations for, for mining the uranium and the coal weren't as rigid as they are now. So the miners weren't really given any protection. And as a consequence, many of those people now have respiratory illnesses and or various cancers. So yeah, I see a subset, a cohort of patients who worked in the uranium mines and mills here in the Four Corners area during, from basically from 1945 to 1984. It was a 40-year period. And you've created some pieces yeah. there that tell yeah. that story. Yeah, you might ask, well, why is it important to talk about this now? Well, the reason is there's over 500 abandoned uranium mine sites that are contaminating water sources. They're contaminating the uh, land where crops are being grown. Animals are impacted and humans are also so the Navajo Nation has a department, of Environmental Protection, the EPA, and the national EPA have gotten together. And the national EPA made money available to the nation to clean up one-tenth of the abandoned mine sites here around the Navajo Nation. But I was making art that talked about this, but hoping something would be done to remediate the land and um, yeah, to clean up these mine sites. The issue is ongoing. One of the problems now with consideration of nuclear energy as an alternative to burning fossil fuels in light of the environment changing, the climate changing. And then there's always um, this conversation in art about it being archival that relates to different types of prints on paper. As I understand uh -huh. it, you've transition from wheat paste to, is it gel mediums? Or so having worked in my home dark room for 22 years and having self-taught the zone system of Ansel Adams, mm -hmm. I really appreciate crisp prints, even if they're coming off a low-end digital printer or a toner-based printer. Wheat paste, what I was finding using wheat flour anyway, was that there was a yellow film that was being applied to the image so that the tonal quality wasn't as strong. The, the images weren't as contrasty as I would like them. I mean, just over the years and talking with other street art artists who do paste stuffs, I learned that they were using a acrylic gel medium, mm -hmm. as is JR. But in truth, he uses a combination of a acrylic gel medium and wallpaper paste. But the nice thing about the acrylic gel medium is that it really pops the uh, black and white tones. And yes, it gives the um, prints a bit of protection from the, from the weather and also from the sun. I also seal the pieces using a water-based polyurethane sealant. But, you know, it's funny because I, having moved to street art, I really have embraced the ethos of letting go and the ephemerality of my work. I mean, it's a reflection of the life experience itself, you know, to give it all you have and the opportunity that you have and then just letting it go. So it's been liberating actually making the move from making gelatin silver prints to working outside. However, I do miss working in the dark room. 
I, I will put that out there. There's a, there's a magic to the dark rooms. But I also talked to another artist recently who started working in NFTs and he was talking about, he just wanted them on the blockchain for that same reason, the longevity of it. I mean, I have to say, I know very little about NFTs, but as you were talking about archival work, that came to mind. As I understood it, the transition from the the, the gel medium part of that was that it would last a little longer than the wheat paste. Yeah, definitely. Image. One of the reasons I switched to uh, gel medium is mm -hmm. because the pieces last two to three times longer longer than using wheat paste or wallpaper glue. Having said that though, it's funny because it really depends on the size of the piece. The standard plotter can print anywhere from 36 to 44 inches wide. So what I found, if I just put up a single panel, a single sheet of paper at maybe seven to eight feet tall, Using wheat paste, that actually might last a long time. And when I say a long time, I mean 10 years. But the piece depth of the, I mean, the paper starts breaking down. Okay, some of my original wheat paste images from nine years ago are still running. They aren't strong. <laughs> they aren't bold images. Um, it's not like I put, yeah, they don't look like I put them up yesterday, but they are still up and running. Well, and how about the actual act of applying it? The only difference is when I'm working with gel medium, I wear vinyl gloves. And when mm -hmm. I work in wheat paste, I just use my bare hands. Yeah. So it just, it just feels different. It feels, smells, and tastes differently. Yeah. Um, the beautiful thing about wheat paste is, you know, depending on where I was, or mm -hmm. where I was working to get a piece up, I would have anything from dogs to flies to horses come and you know stick their nose in the bucket of wheat paste. It's an organic product, it's flour, water, and sugar. Who doesn't love love that? Say, for example, printing in the dark room where you you're handling the paper, and there's the smell, and there's that sensory right. aspect to it and maybe it's almost more different to the artist than it is the actual patron of of the thing you know there's an expression in thailand same same but but different one day the boss and i decided we didn't want to have this mobile wall in the middle of the gallery and we pushed it outside over by the dumpster and we arranged yeah. for my friend deborah by a dumpster it, and it wasn't just any wall. It was a good size wall. It was like, what, seven feet tall, maybe eight feet tall. Oh yeah. It was I like mean, an was... L, it was like an L frame type of thing. Like it was amazing. Her and Deborah the next day was like, I'll pick it up. And so the next day I come into work and one of your wheat paste pieces is on it. And I was like, ah, oh, I like the wall. Like I wanted to keep the wall at that point. And so I called, texted Deborah and said, well, the wall's still here, but it, it has, it's a little different now. Do you still want it? And she said, yeah. now, now I want it even more than ever. So we're like, great. <laughs> and so then I use technology. I get on Google and I'm like, I don't know. I don't even remember what I did. This was about 10 years ago. And I was like, whose art is this? And then I found your blog. Oh, I think it was maybe the next day. I think I found your blog and you had said, you assumed it got sent to the dump that you'd put the piece up and oh, it went to the dump. And then I got in touch and yeah. said, actually, it's not at the dump. It's now on Canyon Road. And for those who don't know, that's the historic arts district in Santa Fe. And so Deborah. Yeah. outside of her gallery until the historic society made her get rid of it i wasn't I aware of that that part of the story okay it, it would still be there if it wasn't for that <laughs> yeah no that's that's an awesome story thank you for filling in the gaps but yeah i mean so there there i was in santa fe one night with some friends trying to find vacant walls and you all literally had a vacant wall you were throwing away and it was such a perfect wall so yeah no. I, I definitely hit it. I'm glad you found it. So so there's a few questions I like to ask all of the guests on the show. And one of my favorite is other artists that you might suggest other people look at. There's a fascinating artist from Portugal whose name is Vils, V-H-I-L-S. 
street artist who does pretty amazing work. He was chiseling bases out of plaster on the exterior of buildings, but he's recently started using like the micro dynamite caps to mm -hmm. um, create his pieces of work. Here in Arizona, there are some amazing artists. L. Mack spent a lot of time in Phoenix, though I think he's living in LA now. Kind of a throwback, a woman who passed away, I think just before she turned 30, her name was Margaret Kill Galen. She's the partner of Barry McGee. They're both um, artists who came out of San Francisco, out of the mission school period in the mid nineties. I recommend them. Just in terms of the aesthetic and the politics, people don't know the work of Dred Scott. I recommend him, African-American artist based out of Chicago. There's a bunch of artists actually in Chicago. Music is another thing I'm interested in. Is, is music important to you? Is yeah, music is my life. You? I'm from North Carolina originally, and North Carolina is the home of some amazing jazz artists like Nina Simone, John Coltrane, Woody Shaw. In terms of contemporary artists, I, I've been listening to a lot of soul, British jazz. Green T. King is someone I've recently fallen in love with. She's a young British artist. Uh, Sons of Kemet, also out of London, I'm a huge fan of. Doug Karn is a jazz musician out of California from the 70s, 80s, 90s. There's one artist I just have to mention who is from Brazil. His name is Milton Nascimento. Milton, Milton Nascimento. And I started listening to Milton when I was in high school back in the 70s. And um, I continue to listen to him. And it's a fascinating thing because even though I don't speak Portuguese, though I was studying it back in 2009, Milton's lyricism and his angelic voice have just gotten me through some really difficult times. Shout out to Milton and all the artists of the Tropicalia movement. Do you collect anything? Yeah, about the time I started doing street art, I was following various street art blogs. I realized that various street artists also have a studio practice and have prints available. So a lot of the art that I've been collecting is by street artists, but that isn't always true. There's a piece here by Judith Supine, S-U-P-I-N-E. Mm -hmm. There's a piece by Doze Green. I definitely recommend checking Doze out. Brian Barnaclo, Stinkfish. <laughs> definitely check out Stinkfish. <laughs> where, where, where is he? Columbia. I love his name. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm collecting work by all these people I just mentioned. Guy is a street artist who also has a studio practice in terms of people who I follow. There's Nani Chacon, who's actually a muralist out of Albuquerque. Lynette Houses comes from a famous art family who I think is, I think her family is based in New Mexico, but they may be out of Arizona. She's part Apache. There's a woman based in Brooklyn whose first name is Tatiana. I think her last name is Basile. There's a woman in Jess Seeds who is Latina. Her name mm -hmm. is Jess Sabogal. Um, I'm not saying her last name correctly, and she's definitely worth checking out on the ground. Uh, I'm, I'm always curious if there's any movies just over time or television shows that have just really inspired you. You know, as someone who is self-taught in art, mm -hmm. one of the series that I find really informative and accessible for non-artists is the PBS series Art 21, Art in the 21st Century. They started, I think, in 2000. I think they just released season eight. I, in fact, I was just doing a search to see if season nine is available and I haven't found it, but Art, Art 21 is something I recommend. I, I get HBO, so I follow a lot of the shows on HBO. The Wire, for example, was something I really enjoyed. I liked Westworld. I never saw an episode of Game of Thrones on HBO. It used to be there was five channels and you just watched what there was. And now there's yeah. just so many different things to tap into. It's um, amazing. I found it interesting to see yeah. what people tap oh. into, but I love traveling. Do you have a favorite place to travel? First place that comes to mind is Brazil. 
Brazil is one of those places that just instills me with a feeling of creativity. It's a difficult place in that there's a large Black population there, and they make up the majority of the poor people in the country. Yet within the country, there seems to be a really strong sense of, well, I wish I could say solidarity and unity because, you know, in truth, any country is divided. But Brazil is known for its music, you know, it's known for its beaches, uh, it's known for their soccer playing. I just like to go there and get inspired by the music, by the art on the street and just having enlightening conversations with people. I, I think that's what it's all about. I appreciate you for taking the time to talk tonight. I know you've been, you've been busy, you've been traveling. Is there anything we haven't talked about? Shout outs? I really want to give you a shout out for your persistence pursuing this interview. There have been a number of, of obstacles, <laughs> but you did this at a time of the month when my bandwidth is relatively strong. So thank you for that. Thank you for your interest in what I'm trying to do over here. Well, super excited to talk to you and it's been fun. Yeah, likewise, Anne. Thank you. All the Absolutely. best to you. Thank you for watching Art in the Raw, Conversations with Creative People. I hope you enjoyed meeting Chip Thomas and that you're feeling inspired. If so, consider subscribing to like-minded friends and I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.